Welcome to this channel and to the story about a cozy Halloween evening without any drama, horror or negativity. Halloween at its best, just with pumpkins, laughter, sweets and love. Enjoy the coziness. Halloween It had been a very cool but not yet frosty day. Autumn had come over the country since October after the late summer in September and had transformed the forests and the landscape. The wide green fields and treetops had become hay fields and waving seas of red leaves, among which one could stroll pleasurably and take home a splendid specimen or two of a maple or oak leaf to decorate the dining table for a few weeks. And the autumn wind blew hundreds of leaves into the large garden of Charlottesville, a little town in the United States of America. Some of these gardens were in the center of the little town and were only about five times the size of a European row house garden. Others, on the outskirts of town, were about a hundred times as large. In Charlottesville, space abounded. Fifteen-year-old Marcia lived with her parents and her two older brothers, William and Trevor, in a house on the outskirts. It was nearly five in the afternoon, and the last rays of the sun had just departed, from the large rock on which she sat. Turning a narrow strip on the surface of the water in front of her into a liquid gold. Marcia began to feel a little bit cold now. She wrapped herself more tightly in her thick wool jacket. The hollow in the stone was just warm enough to sit in for a few more minutes. The lake in front of her was part of her parents' property. Since she was a little girl, she swam in it in the summer, skated on it in the winter, and spent hours on its shore in the spring and fall, looking out at the water or reading one book after another. Plus, it was the perfect area to throw a party. Marcia smiled and glanced to the side. At the campfire site on the shore, she and William had spent the last few hours setting up benches made of logs, stacking a supply of drinks and stringing lanterns between the trees. Then they had baked pumpkin pies together with mom and dad, they had made soup and carved the faces into the pumpkin shells that would be all over Charlottesville that night. A jagged mouth, and triangles for eyes and a nose. The orange faces now stood next to the fire pit and up by the house, waiting for Marcia and her brother to light the candles in them tonight. Halloween could come. It was getting colder. Marcia climbed down from the rock and walked through the garden to the house. William sat in the living room, tinkering with a stereo. Is it still broken? asked Marcia, sitting down next to him. William answered only after he had made one last move and pressed play with a tense expression on his face. Actually, it should be working now. The metal band that banged the keys and strings a second later proved him right. He gave a thumbs up and switched off. Another leisurely coffee, sis, before the party starts, he asked. She smiled and nodded. A moment later, the smell of espresso and the laughter of two siblings drifted through the house. Trevor got home a little after seven. He had been at the library, cramming for his November exams as usual for the past few weeks. 
By the time he arrived at the garden fence, dusk was falling and his sister was standing just outside the house, bent over one of the pumpkins lighting the candles. Trevor stopped for a moment by the garden gate and watched her. Her long blonde curls fell over her shoulders and she grumbled softly to herself as the lighter kept giving up the ghost. Trevor grinned, thinking of how he had carried her around the garden as a little boy, William in tow, and she had kicked about on his arms at every flower, every butterfly, so he would set her down and she could get a closer look at these little wonders of the world. Then she'd point excitedly at tiny yellow dots on little wings or spot the tiniest bugs on leaves. Things Trevor didn't even see. Or she would suddenly scramble down to the lake because a fish had appeared somewhere just below the surface. Trevor had always admired her for her delicate perception. Marcia was still a little like she was then, Trevor thought, as she carefully strung a string of orange and yellow lights around the front door. As she took a few steps back to look at her handiwork from a distance, she noticed her brother. Trevor! She ran to him and gave him a big hug. He laughed and returned her hug, double and triple. Then he patted her on the shoulders appreciatively and pointed to the entryway. Really nicely turned out, he said. Wait till you see the fireplace later, said Marcia, beaming as she pulled him into the house. In the hallway, their parents were getting ready to go out. Dad stood in front of the mirror and put on his new fall coat. It was grey and had an elegant collar that matched his snow-white scarf very well. Mom was placing a large pumpkin pie next to a bottle in a gift basket. Well, you too, said Dad, closing the last button. Are you excited about your celebration? You betcha, the two said and laughed. You're looking forward to yours too, asked Trevor. Tell Aunt Agatha and Uncle Harry dearest regards from us. Next time, we'll come along again. We'll pass that along, nodded Dad, and Mom said, You'll see those two soon. Agatha's going to be the Christmas angel at the market by the city hall again in mid-November. Trevor grinned broadly. She wouldn't miss it, would she? He winked at his sister. Mom gave her kids a kiss on the cheek and said, Behave yourselves and have fun. Marcia nodded, while Trevor clicked his heels together and saluted with the flat of his hand to his forehead. Yes, ma'am. As they walked out, Mom said to Dad, Those big kids. And Dad replied, Well, they are our kids. Then they got in the car and were soon out of sight of the house. At half past seven, the first guests arrived. They were Caitlin and Frank, a couple who were friends of William. He led them into the living room and said, You have free choice of seats. Make yourselves at home. The two thanked him and Caitlin flopped down on the sprawling white corner sofa. Ah, I'm tired. Been helping my parents winterize our yard all day. Now I'm happy to let you guys pamper me for a bit. Frank sat down next to her and stroked her back, and William pointed to the large glass bowl on the living room table that was literally overflowing with Halloween candy. Help yourself and relax. Caitlin opened her mouth to a soundless wow and after a moment's consideration decided on one of the small marzipan pumpkins. She let it disappear into her mouth in one bite and closed her eyes with relish. Marcia, 
came out of the kitchen with a tray. Hi, hi! A few hugs and greetings were exchanged. Marsha placed the tray on the living room table and pointed to the filled glasses on it. Cocktails of raspberries, mint, apple and sparkling water. Dig in! Within the next 15 minutes, the living room filled up. Trevor's girlfriend Haley and two of his fellow university students, Paul and Sam, were soon there, as were Anna, who lived next door and had her little sister Mary in tow, and Marcia's friends Sarah and Amy. With them, the round was complete. While Trevor, William and Marcia disappeared into the kitchen for 10 minutes to make the final preparations for dinner, the others made themselves comfortable in the living room and began conversations about the fall vacations, the last holidays, school, current movies and, of course, Halloween. Everyone knew and liked each other. Quiet murmurs of voices and the gentle clinking of cocktail glasses filled the air. Laughter rose here and there. Little Mary stood at the patio door and gazed longingly down at the lake, where no fire was burning yet, but the pumpkins were glowing and the lanterns were swaying back and forth between the trees, like a colorful dragon's tail. Her big sister had to assure her three times that the fire would start outside soon. Then William came back into the living room with a pot of steaming, creamy soup. The pie and roasted pumpkin seeds filling the whole room with a wonderful, warm scent of autumn made even Mary's weight easier. The dining table was big enough for everyone and it turned out to be a very cheerful dinner. Haley told anecdotes of Professor Carlton, undisputedly the most clever but also the most muddle-headed professor in the entire university, or at least in the entire department of mathematics. Trevor and Sam nodded incessantly, adding to them their own experience with Carlton. How one day he had biked to class all the way through a heavy spring rain without an umbrella and hadn't noticed his clothes dripping for an hour because he himself was so fascinated by the Riemann hypothesis he was telling his students about. How, on another day, he had forgotten which room his lecture was in and had strayed into the faculty of English. The buildings blend into each other, it must be said in his defense, Paul interjected, amused. And the lecture halls really all look the same, too. Still, it was almost the end of the semester and he had apparently never taken a look at the faces of his students, Otherwise, he would not have started talking about prime numbers in front of the English majors. Sam contradicted him. They actually had two lessons on the subject of English literature before Shakespeare on the schedule and then they were quite puzzled. But it all cleared up. The others bent over laughing. Listening to this, Amy snorted, wiping a small tear of laughter from her eye. I'm already looking forward to studying. Are you going to study math too? asked Haley with interest. Marcia grinned and Sarah suppressed a chuckle. Amy wasn't exactly interested in numbers. Amy said, no, no, math is not my thing, but drama is what I'm going to do. I am sure there are entertaining professors there too. You bet, exclaimed Anna. Didn't I tell you that my cousin has been studying that since March? So, listen up. Many more stories were shared and the mood became happier and happier. 
They stepped outside at about 9.30, wrapped thickly in wool sweaters and jackets. Trevor and Haley were already tending the fire, so when you stepped out of the living room, you were looking at a crackling bonfire, glowing yellow, with millions of red sparks shooting into the black night sky as the wood beneath it shifted or crackled. Man, this is beautiful, exclaimed Amy, stopping beside Marcia. Sarah came after the two with a blanket under her arm and a warm cap over her brown curls. She nodded when she saw the fire. For a moment, the three were silent. They had been to many Halloween parties together, and each of them thought at that moment of the ones that had passed and of the many happy hours they had spent together over the years. Then they walked down to the shore of the lake together. Close to the fire, holding Anna's hand, stood little Mary and gazed into the flames with bright, wide eyes. The highlight of the evening for her Her sister thought fondly, watching her. Marcia waved to them both as she approached with Sarah and Amy, but Mary didn't see them. Anna did, and waved back and said to the three, pointing at her little sister, She loves fire, ever since she was really, really little. I think it's extraordinary. I was always more afraid of it at that age. Trevor added a few logs onto the other side and sparks flew far up into the treetops. Mary put her head back and tracked each glowing grain until it became invisible. Marcia knelt beside her and said to her, You are going to be a firefighter someday, huh? Mm Mm-hmm, the little girl made an agreement. Then she pointed to the lake. And you, a swimmer in the Olympics? Marcia looked at Mary, puzzled. And then she noticed something in her eyes. Since Mary was born, the Millers had visited the Ericsons often. Mom and Dad were close friends with Anna and Mary's parents, and Marcia could remember many days when they had sat together here in the garden or in the house. In mornings in August, when Marcia, the first to jump in the lake every day, was still in her bathing suit when the Millers arrived. On evenings in June, when Marcia was late for dinner because she just didn't want to get out of the water. On an autumn day, when she'd come into the living room, shivering from the cold, but animated by the beautiful blue world she'd emerged from. And mom hadn't gotten her warm again until she'd had a pint of tea and a huge blanket. Marcia realized that Mary had the same memories. And as she knelt beside her at that moment, gazing into Mary's big, clear eyes that reflected the warm spray of the fire, she understood that Mary understood her, that Mary loved fire as she loved water. What was in Mary's eyes was understanding. Marcia smiled and said, That would be nice with the Olympics, yes. But if I don't become that, I'll just stay here and keep swimming in my lake every day. And will you then keep making campfires for me too? Asked Mary enthusiastically. Marcia solemnly promised and even raised her hand to swear. 
Mary giggled and rejoiced and then turned to William, who, along with Caitlin and Frank, had gathered sticks in the garden and was now holding some out to Mary and the others. They all took one and grouped around the fire with the others. A wonderful, romantic evening had begun. There was storytelling and eager listening, old tales from grandmother's time and new anecdotes from the small, cozy town life of Charlottesville. Sometimes it was quiet because the whole party was listening to one, and sometimes the laughter resounded loudly through the night, across the lake, through the trees, and across the street to the neighbors who were sitting by the fireplace with their guests and who were at least moved to a broad smile by the merry youth next door. It was cold, but the fire warmed them all, and the lanterns and large pumpkins cast long, colorful shadows of light through the dark garden. Marshmallows and tiny little potatoes were grilling on the sticks, cooking within minutes and tasting wonderful. Time passed and just before midnight, Mom and Dad returned. Marcia noticed their house over there getting light. Shortly afterwards, the patio door opened and against the glow of the light behind them, the silhouettes of her parents appeared. They were both greeted with a big hello at the lake. Mr. Erickson, Mrs. Erickson, how are you? shouted Paul joyfully. And Haley ran to hug her future in laws, whom she hadn't seen in days. May we two old people sit down with you? asked Dad to the group. Before we send you all home to bed like we promised your parents, we need you to tell us about the latest news from the youth of Charlottesville. At half past one, the last guests had left. The campfire pit was still smoldering away, looking like a red-hot ball of fire floating above the ground on the shore of the lake. William, Trevor and Mom formed a chain to the house for the crates of empty drink bottles. They chatted as they did so. Marcia stood on a ladder, taking down one lantern after another from the string between the trees. It was as cold as autumn is allowed to be, on the last night before the first month of winter, before the first November day. The air already smelled of frost, even though there were no icy crystals forming on the metal wires that hung the lanterns from the string. Marcia took a deep breath and closed her eyes for a moment. Besides the approach of winter, there was a residue of fire and smoke and the scent of spruce needles and wilted leaves in the air. Behind her, she heard the faint sound of waves gathering in the middle of the lake, weakening as they made their way over water plants, gravel and sand to the shore. Somewhere, an eagle owl called long and thoughtfully into the night. And over at the house, Marcia heard her mother telling some amusing story about Uncle Harry, often interrupted by the laughter of her two beloved brothers. Later, as she lay in her bed, The warm, reddish glow of the chain of lights outside the front door streamed through the window into her room. Drifting off to sleep, 
Marcia felt deep peace.